Hey guys, welcome back to Tarot Typhus FPL. It's Fran here, and I'm back with my Game Week 1 initial draft. This is the first kind of conception of the draft that I posted on YouTube. Uh, I have been kind of constantly rethinking and retinkering around my drafts. I've changed formations. I've changed my conceptions of teams. You know, Chelsea, for example, was a team that I was quite high on just because their fixture run is so sweet. But just looking at them versus Arsenal, looking at how incomplete the squad is, or incohesive, rather, um... I just feel like th th there are some question marks there and and it has changed my draft judgment but we still have two to three weeks where i might be slightly higher on some teams slightly lower on some teams as we head towards the final deadline for now i'm also i would say immediately from the offset quite high on united quite high on tottenham as well city is another question mark too i think the Holland king question mark will come up later in the video as you can see uh, when i discuss forwards but for now let's actually start off with the defenders so with the defenders, I have Trent and Robertson, the kind of usual suspects that you'd expect in a slightly more big of the back formation. Nico Williams is on my bench, as you can see. So I am operating, obviously, a back four. Gabriel is in my team. And I'll mention Gabriel in a second. But just going back to Trent and Robertson, you do have two players here who are basically some of the most efficient players in FPL. And efficient might be my favorite word at the start of the season because you have the full benefit of watching the previous year seeing how the teams uh, played out and performed and whether there are un any significant impacts in the preseason or through transfers that might change your judgment on certain players. And I don't think that has changed anything at all with Trent and Robertson. I mean, Trent was someone who did kind of fall off in terms of his production in the second half of last season, but Robertson was someone who, on the other hand, as we know, was the key performer in the second half of the season, especially from gaming 20 to gaming 38, the most points accumulated. So that's interesting because part of that too is 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 colored by Luis Diaz joining the team and I know some people who, who are going salahless might be considering Luis Diaz as a result right because of what he brings to the team and what the team can do um but for me Robertson is definitely a lock I think he ended the season extremely well he doesn't start the season with any sort of injuries which was the pr problem in the previous season uh so I think Robertson makes a lot of sense the other kind of contemplation that I had was going for Allison because Allison does save you you know, 7.0 versus minus 5.5. You got that 1.5 million um, back from Allison, but ultimately I think I've decided on Ederson. Yes, Ederson's slightly inefficient as a keeper, but I think it's it's that guarantee of points as from a elite defensive team that is kind of worthwhile in the keeper position because we, we, we're looking at midfielders this season and I think they are very, very highly priced and, and in my opinion, even slightly overpriced. So that's kind of made me think about going for you know, a back four, a back five, and, and, and I think Nico Williams occupying that quintessential sort of 4.0 position as a playing player does give a lot of value that I can spread around to my midfield and my forwards, and there were specific players I wanted to hit on be between the midfielders and forwards, so that's kind of why I've, I've arrived at this back four. Gabriel is probably the biggest question mark here, uh, but just touching on Ederson as well, ultimately it was just about having another city player that i think can be very productive he is still cheaper than diaz and laporte who i'm absolutely certain will play if fit laporte is sort of dealing with an injury situation i don't think there's necessarily been concrete news about his return date his expected date whether the severity of the injury is is, is some sort of ligament damage but ake has looked fantastic in the preseason and to be honest if there was any tinkering i would do with um any sort of conception of a draft early on i think it, it might be really changing robertson out and saving money pushing it to my midfield and my forwards but i think you have to also stay true to what you think will actually get the most points and ultimately i, I do think these mid uh these defender premiums are the ones that give you the most points and therefore that's why Cancelo's in my team you can see robertson's in my team and trent's in my team gabriel is going to be that x factor for me i think his first two games are so key because crystal palace and leicester as we know from the previous season were two of the teams that had the worst set piece defending when it came to defending versus corners they actually conceded the most amount of goals and i think gabriel is that sort of key player who established himself as one of the key aerial threats in the previous year and and therefore i think it's a great opportunity to start the season with gabriel i have some question marks over zinchenko at 5.0 i just think he, he isn't someone who necessarily always contributes towards um specifically goals and assists i, I think he's very very good in terms of build up and he's going to be a huge contributor to this arsenal team from a consistency point of view someone who unlike Tierney, should be able to play for the bulk of the season and even maybe at times flexibly play within the center mid position if they need some sort of depth over there but as i said i think gabriel is great to start the season off with try and attack those crystal palace and leicester games um you don't always see me going for center backs but this is the one opportunity where i think because gabriel is so nailed and i don't have to really deal with the dilemma of rotation within the right backs 
even maybe Saliba versus kind of Ben White for that center back spot. And then Ben White, therefore, in the right back position, being contested with players like Tomiyasu and Cedric. And then just going back to the left back, where it seems like Nuno Tavares is leaving, but we've had some question marks over Tierney and whether he can play. And then Zinchenko as well, whether he'll actually play the full 90 minutes for games and, and so on and so forth. So I, I do really like this defense. If we now move on to the midfield, this is actually a, a kind of position where I've gone very, very light. And, and as you and as you can expect, now that you're seeing three midfielders, you can tell that I'm going for three forwards. And and clearly, the reason why, as I said, is probably because I think the midfielders are slightly overpriced. Now, you might probably say that midfielders inherently are are more efficient and, and, and better than forwards. And, and you'd, you'd, to be honest, be correct. I think the, the main difference for me why I've gone for three forwards is specifically because I think the forwards that I've chosen have the most expected variance for me where I think there's a lot of upside uh, so long as things go to plan. And I will say that my draft is conditional on Cristiano Ronaldo leaving Man United. Um, so that might be a little bit of a hint there. But anyways, if I go and start off with Neto, I think at 5.5, you have a player at b between the midfield and forward positions is the most well-priced 5.5 player in the game when it comes to attackers. And I think Neto sometimes playing at the false nine role, sometimes playing almost as a striker even, and then all being a very, very direct winger regardless, even if he is to play at a back four formation, is someone that I'm extremely interested in having in my team. For me, Pedence and Neto are at the same price, and some people might be thinking Pedence is a little bit more interesting, but I think just over the two years that I've been watching uh, both Pedence and Neto in this team, and obviously Neto, we had a very small sample size in the previous year, but I just think Neto is much more direct as a player and a little bit more clinical than Pedence, who is very, very good at dribbling, getting into technical spaces, but isn't very, very good at finishing. Salah, I, I think he's a bit of a non-negotiable in my current draft structure. I just couldn't see the opportunity to really move into Son or De Bruyne. Ultimately, for me, De Bruyne was a question mark between either him or Holland, and it's I I I would rather probably go for Holland. Um, it's still to be seen, obviously, when you look at my forwards whether I go for Holland or Kane. But that's kind of where I uh, had my conclusion over De Bruyne, just because when I was watching Holland in the game versus Bayern Munich, you could actually see that De Bruyne wasn't someone who was occupying too many key central positions up top he was actually playing slightly deeper right because when Haaland's occupying those central pl places in the box you, you no longer see De Bruyne kind of occupying those false nine positions which he would have when you for example were watching let's say when Julian Alvarez was on the pitch I, I do I did see De Bruyne occupy more of the central positions at least closer towards the enemy goal and, and that's for me the the key difference but I think De Bruyne is definitely going to be an underrated asset and he's going to be more consistent too, because I think I feel like we have less of a concern over De Bruyne, um, given that he he's no not currently right now playing with any kind of injury niggles, and he's not playing um, over an injury. And so, therefore, I think I, I I've gone back between Salah and Son as my kind of big question mark for this team. Ultimately, the reason why I went for Salah was just the the fixtures looking a little bit better between game weeks one and eight. Yes, we know Son can score versus all sorts of teams. I think the the Chelsea game is a tough game. And for me, I think I couldn't really justify going for a third Liverpool player that was a defender, right? I, I wanted to have at least one Liverpool attacker. And it was really just Salah versus someone like a Luis Diaz or a Nunez to me. And that's what it came down to. I just don't have the guarantees of the minutes over Nunez and Luis Diaz. Whereas I do have quite a bit of comfort over the last few years just seeing Klopp have the faith to give Salah plenty of minutes with exception to AFCON. And I mean, AFCON's over. It's not going to really take precedence this year. So I think this is a great year for Salah to play a lot of minutes regardless. And you now have, for me, the scope with these these, these starting games to even go potentially with a pure Salah draft and having an extremely well-rounded team. At this point in time, though, I, I have gone for Salah. Um, and so, yeah, he's going to be my captain probably for game weeks one and two specifically. And Martinelli is, is the third midfielder who is a part of this draft. He's the biggest question mark in my opinion here where he's clearly the most rotatable piece that I've picked. You can you can see for for reasons that I've picked Gabriel, I, I really prefer people being nailed. But I but I think at that kind of six point zero position at the midfield, there is a bit of flexibility there where I can say I can probably push myself up or down as soon as game week three, right? If if it seems like let's say Martinelli would be starting to be displaced by Smith Rowe. But from what I've seen in the preseason so far, Martinelli has been exceptionally interesting as an attacker. He is also someone, if you look at the expected kind of uh, numbers in terms of creative numbers, such as expected assists, and, and also just goal scoring numbers with expected goals, is someone who, who does actually find himself in great positions, just like 
Bukayo Saka. And because he has that 2 mil price sort of discount, I, I just think he there's a lot of value there, especially if Martin I can kind of lock down that left mid position. On top of that too, I, I do think Smith Rowe has the potential to even rotate with someone like Odegaard. Uh, that wasn't really done too much last season. I, I think Arteta really enjoys playing Odegaard the full 85 minutes at the very minimum. And one of my fears for Martinelli is going to be the kind of five sub rotation structure that we have in the Premier League and, and the impacts on Martinelli, I think are going to be quite huge because Arsenal do have a little bit of winger depth. But he was given the benefit of the doubt, in my opinion, in this preseason. I think that will continue with the first few games so long as Arsenal do well. And I really expect Martinelli to do well. Um, because he's looked fantastic and, and he is a very direct player, someone who can cut inside and, and, and provide a lot of shot making opportunities for himself and create as well, just like when he pr provided the assist to Odegaard. So he is going to be a little bit of a, a question mark, I'd say, in this draft. And maybe the, there will be some changes within the next two weeks for me to think about whether I move Martin to someone who's a bit more nailed. Um, and that's going to be obviously having a look at my forwards as well, seeing if I can kind of take some money on my forwards, and maybe shift back into a more stable, more. Um, I guess template 442 as well. But let's actually move on to the forwards just to round off my team. So I've gone for Marshall, Kane, and Jesus here. Kane is the most interesting asset for me in terms of how much time I've invested thinking about Kane versus Holland. And ultimately I think I've arrived at Kane just because I have a bit more guarantee over Kane and, and his lack of you know being being dealt with sort of weird injury situations. And with Holland, I I don't really want a premium early on in the season where I have to book away a transfer from him. The fixtures are fantastic for Haaland, and just watching him versus Bayern Munich, I mean, I think it's inevitable that he'll have a fantastic goal-scoring season, and I can definitely understand why people are looking at three mediums as a result. But I think the same can really be said about Kane. We have the consistency there year on year in terms of watching Kane perform very, very well. I think last year was actually a bit of a dip in the start of the season, but when you actually look at and contextualize how well he did under Conte, I think there's a lot of scope to say that with a full season of Conte, with a full preseason, with some upgrades in defense positions uh, and also depth overall within the midfield, that Kane should have a fantastic year once again, just like when he was that kind of star player in the Josie Mourinho season um, when he was leading FPL in, in points. And so I think Kane is, has just been so consistent year on year. He's He should also be getting a lot of penalties too. You have technical players like Richarlison, Kulishevsky, and even Son who can always earn you penalties. And I think that's going to be a huge contributor this season um, for a bulk of Kane point holes. And I think starting with Southampton, for example, just a fantastic fixture to even maybe even consider Kane as the captain. Uh, but we'll talk about that in just a sec. Marshall is someone who I've actually, I've decided to go for. I think a lot of people are either choosing between Marshall, Sancho, or Rashford. And to be honest, I probably stuck with a Sancho structure myself in my head for the longest time, but it does seem like Ronaldo is moving closer and closer towards leaving United. And just watching the preseason and the fact that United don't really have too much depth in the in the central positions, I just think that Martial is set up to have a great season if he can kind of keep his head, you know, screwed on correctly. And and ultimately he's looked fantastic in the preseason. He's he's shown incredible link up play too. Not only just pure goal scoring form, but someone who's actually able to really show the kind of strengths that he he featured around two years ago when he had a great season under Ole. And 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 that was him kind of playing you know, back to back towards his goal, being able to to hold off defenders extremely well, lay off and, and create chances for other people, and also just use his fantastic movement and also his actual physical frame to actually get himself into great attacking positions and score goals. So I do think Martial has a scope to have a great season. Just because he has that slight price discount from Sancho, I do like Martial for now. On top of that too, I think the question next would be, why not just go for Rashford? He's another... 0.5 mil uh, of a price decrease compared to Marshall. And I think the, the, the key thing for, for Rashford is that when I compare, let's say, Sancho, Marshall and Rashford overall, I, I think Sancho has been contributory both from the creative point of view and also just the goal scoring point of view, whereas Rashford has so far only really shown me um, abilities in terms of being able to kind of score the goal. And I think when we're looking at points and we're trying to count how many projected points people have. I just think that Marshall and Sancho are, are, are that much more interesting from a creative point of view, and, and they'll get more points from that basis. Whereas for, for Rashford, so far, what I've seen is mostly just tap-ins and, and, and also some decent direct runs, but nothing like two or three years ago when he was constantly kind of skilling defenders away, um, creating a lot of space and also providing a lot of uh, chances for his teammates. I think that's going to be the big difference to see whether Rashford is able to kind of build up that form. For now, I have a little bit more faith in Martial and what he's shown in the preseason. And I think it's already a sufficient enough gamble to go for United because 
we all know what good preseason is doing. They could really mean nothing, right? Ultimately, this is a little bit of bias from my part. Just looking at United getting a little bit high over them. But I do have a little bit more faith in Ten Hag as manager, ultimately. Um, and I think this squad of players, especially if Ronaldo leaves, should be very hungry to kind of prove themselves un under a new regime. And, and I'm kind of hoping that Martial will be that player from my team if he stays. As far as Jesus, he's probably one of the most nailed players I, I, I can see across a lot of people's template drafts. And, and I think there's there's no reason to shy away from Jesus. I'll, he's another kind of question mark where he could have just as easily been Saka if I wanted to go for a 4-4-2 structure. But just watching Arsenal in the preseason, I feel like the team is very, very focused on, on being able to play with a striker who's very, very quick, able to run in between the lines, but also drop deep at times and build up. And you'll see that Jesus is very good at that. If you ever watch a, a Pep Guardiola press conference and, and, and see how he praises Jesus, it will be about his defensive work rate as well and his ability to also basically put maximum effort towards creating chances uh, through press, through build-up and things like that. And I think Jesus is such an upgrade uh, for over Lacazette in the point of view where he is actually that kind of lethal finisher and, and, that, and has that sort of lethal pace in terms of being able to actually run past defenders and create those chances for himself, as opposed to just create chances for other people. So that's the big difference there. And I think Jesus has clearly shown, alongside this Arsenal team, that they're very capable of playing around a striker and a central threat such as Jesus. And that's pretty much why I've gone for this draft so far. This is, once again, obviously just a draft. Um, there's a lot of tinkering to be done. I feel like if I was to tell you my watch list right now, I'm actually thinking about players like Nathan Ake and what he might mean uh, if he can kind of establish himself into the starting eleven. Also thinking about maybe replacements to Martinelli. Obviously, there's a huge lack of Chelsea and lack of blue in my team. Even a lack of Spurs defense. Um, for me, Doherty is a little bit on my radar because I think if you watch Antonio Conte's comments, as I mentioned in the tier list video, it does seem like Doherty is set to start the season and actually play a lot of games at right back. And, to, and, and it's his position um, to lose, really. As far as Chelsea, I just really wasn't impressed so far with the preseason performances overall. The Arsenal one was a, was a big kind of question mark where there's still two to three or four players that I think Tuchel clearly doesn't trust or doesn't have much faith over and nothing hasn't really changed from a transfer point of view where I can say I'm expecting Chelsea to do well but Reese James is going to be clearly missed in this draft um if, if there was a time where I could maybe fit fit, fit Reece James into this draft structure and find him back in my team I'd probably maybe move away from Ederson could even think about going to Allison dropping Robertson and going into James maybe going for a back five although right now I, I see him a little bit I think swayed away from it just because I'm not exactly sure of what the situation is between the rotation uh, that Spurs can present and then also Chelsea just not looking as exciting as I thought they would be, especially with also Ben Chilwell seemingly kind of um, being rested because it seems like he, he had a very aggressive injury and needs to be managed in terms of his minutes. And that's pretty much what it comes down to. This is my initial draft so far. Uh, let me know what you guys think um, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Hey guys, I forgot to mention about captaincy, but it's definitely going to be placed on Mo. I think the big reason there is just Fulham haven't been able to strengthen their squad as much as some of the other uh, promotion candidates. And I, th I think when you're looking at some of the squads in the Premier League, yes, Southampton are a pretty poor one. Um, and and Sp Kane has had a splendid kind of preseason, but ultimately so is Salah. And I just think that strength of opposition, probably slightly worse um, when we're looking at Fulham in comparison to Southampton. And that's pretty much how it goes. I'm not really super tempted or, or I've not even booked in a transfer in my mind to go Kane to Haaland game week two, but there is the possibility there, of course, because the Burnmouth game is on the cards for City. Uh, we'll see what happens, of course, in the opening set of fixtures. Um, hopefully, Haaland will actually be able to shine. It'll be interesting, I think, to actually have some diversity within the premium positions early in the season, as opposed to last year, where it only really kind of took place in the last five to seven game weeks when you had options like Sun and, and De Bruyne. So we'll see what happens there. I, I do think I'm probably quite happy to go and stick with Kane early on, uh, but we'll see what happens. I think news about, let's say, whether Haaland is, is is progressing really well with his injuries is another kind of point in my mind to think about. I, I do think if I end up starting the season with Haaland, he probably is going to be my Gaming 2 captain. But that's about it for now. Thank you guys so much for watching.